Lovely. So I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping first um, and some introductions. So today's session will be on getting qualified as a youth worker. Um, we are really, really lucky today, today to, to have, have three fantastic people, three fantastic guests to speak to us. So we've got Kevin Jones, who's the director, deputy director of youth work at the National Youth Agency, who's going to be giving us a presentation and talking through um, what is youth work qualification, what the types of qualifications and, and you know, how can it work for you. Um, Maria Moodin, who's a youth violence program manager and qualified youth worker in uh, the Young Westminster Foundation. And Yara Murdad, who's the CEO of J Delve and qualified youth worker um, who is based in Ealing. So the format of the session is going to be um, Kevin's going to speak to us first about qualifications. Uh, we're then going to hear from Mariam and Yara, who are going to tell us a little bit about their experience um, and how being qualified helps them in their work, helps them develop their practice. Um, and then towards the end, we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion and, and Q&A. Um, we are hoping that we're thinking the best way to manage it will be if you've got questions that pop into your head as you sort of as you're as you're listening then feel free to to throw them down into the chat and we will try to come back to them at the end uh, in the Q&A or if you'd like to ask a question if you could use the raise your hand function and we will do our best to get around to everybody um the May what we'll do when we're doing Q&A, we'll jump backwards and forwards between you know, one question kind of live and then one from the chat if need be to get through as many as possible. Um, if we don't get through every single question, what we'll do is we'll try and save some up, get some answers for you and then send them uh, around when we send the meeting recording as well. So I think that is actually just about it from me. Um, I haven't done a quick introduction, but my name's Chris. I've been working, Chris Richardson Wright, I've been working with the Young Westminster Foundation on the Level Up Youth Work Programme, and I'm joined from uh, Young Westminster from Level Up Youth Work Programme by Nora as well. Um, but we aren't qualified youth workers, so you're not here to, to hear about us and our experience. So with no further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Kevin. So Kev, thank you very much for joining us today and take it away. Cheers, Chris. Hello, everyone. It's very good to be here. Um, so, yeah, I've got a bit of a presentation that goes through kind of bits about the MYA, what we do, why we were formed, all of that. Um, and then I'll talk through the different qualifications that are available uh, that are both, well, and I'll explain what JNC means. That's quite a biggie. Um, but also there's sort of non-JNC qualifications that it's worth, worth going through as well, how they all fit together. Um, a little bit about why it might be an idea or why we think qualification is a good idea. It's not necessary. We do, at the MYA, think that uh, voluntary and unqualified staff have got a, an equal role to play, but I'll talk that through as well. A um, couple of things before I kick off with the presentation. Jump in. If you've got a question, feel free to, to shout, Oi, Kev, shut up, and I'll answer if there's something really pressing. That's I'm not precious about it. Um, and... Uh, yeah, no, I think that's it, really. For yeah, just interrupt me as rude as you want, and um, I'll try and address stuff as I go through. It's not a speech that I've prepared, so it's fine. You won't be throwing me off. Um, and as Chris said, there's a space afterwards for dealing with questions as well. Um, if I make that sort of noise, it's because my cat's stabbing my leg. He's getting uh, much uh, more clingy in his old age, and my legs are covered in scars from where he scratches them, so... We'll try and get through with him being a little bit calmer. Right, first hurdle, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, good. Share. And I need to make this into a slideshow. Right, this is where it's all going to go wrong, because I've got to make this into a slideshow instantly. Right, and it's going to be on a different screen. Than I thought. Good, can everyone see that? Yeah, excellent. Right, yeah. okay, so... Yes, youth work, professional qualifications and training. It's useful to talk a little bit about the history of the National Youth Agency. Um, so the MYA is 60 years old this year uh, in one of its iterations. Um, we were founded in 1964. We weren't called the National Youth Agency then. Um, but the reason why we were formed uh, is intrinsically linked with youth work training so some of you may or may not have heard of something called the Albemarle Report. Um, the Albemarle Report isn't the beginning of youth work in England, but it's the beginning of a kind of statutory youth service in England. 
it's where government started taking youth work seriously. Um, the government, there, there was youth work going on. YMCA had been doing stuff, the Scouts had been doing stuff for ages. The government realised that this was kind of a thing. Uh, and they commissioned Lady Albemarle to have a look at what the youth service was and make some recommendations. And it was groundbreaking. It was a really, really important report. Um, and what it said basically was youth works ace. We like youth work, let's have more of it. Um, essentially, it was kind of, you know, they, they were looking at the outcomes for young people that were uh, achieved through youth work, the function that youth work performed in local and national strategy. And it made loads of recommendations as to how we should get more of it, really. And there's been nothing since then that's been as, as groundbreaking. Uh, the important things that happened in terms of qualification, I mean, there, was a, there was a huge investment in youth services. So they spent masses and masses of money building youth centres all over the country. And you can still see some of them. Um, the kind of single story prefabricated concrete buildings are often what's called Albemarle centres that were built during this period. Um, but the other recommendations that were made that relate to qualification were... They said that youth workers should be trained. It should be um, the reason for that. And the reason why we still talk about qualification now um, is because they wanted it to be a profession and they wanted it to be a profession along there it is, along the lines of um, <laughs> along the lines of teaching and social work and whatever else. And so all of those have got qualification frameworks. And so it was felt that youth workers should have one too. Uh, so the Admiral report set up this thing called the National College based in Leicester. Um, and that was the first training center for youth workers. And they put about 300 youth, work, youth workers through it. Some really, really famous ones. A guy called Bernard Davies, who uh, was writing stuff that I was studying when I was at college. You know, loads and loads and loads of um, youth workers or famous youth workers or long in the tooth youth workers were trained at the National College um, in the early 60s. Um, and the MYA was set up as the information center um, for the National College. So we've always had this link with um, qualification and and, um, and training. It's changed through the years. There were several government organisations. So we became the National Youth Agency, as is now, in 1991, with the amalgamation of the National Youth Bureau. And um, I mean, you don't need to know all the details. Um, but again, the responsibilities of the various different government departments that were merged to make us. Uh, were to do with training standards and qualification. So it's our bread and butter. So if you look at, um, if, if anybody says, which they never will do, uh, what's the difference between the NYA as a national youth charity and UK Youth or and, you know any of the other large national youth charities, our thing is that we're linked with quality, with qualification and standards. Um, and we're the regulator for the qualifications. So that's the difference between us and the others. Um, so that's a bit of the history. Uh, and a bit of kind of, you know, why uh, they felt that qualification was important. So our function relating to that is kind of, um, is, is yeah, I mean, we do loads of other stuff relating to uh, youth work, but the stuff relating to qualification are these things here. So with the PSRB, with the Professional Standards Regulatory Body, um, now most professions will have one of these. Social work's got Social Work England, uh, teaching's got one, medicine's got one. Um, and the responsibility of those bodies is just to uh, regulate the standards of the training. Um, and the reason for that links in with this next thing, the relationship to JNC. So when youth work was established as a um, as a profession in, in England, um, obviously professions all have regulated terms and conditions. So if you're a teacher in you know, I live in Manchester, so if you're a teacher down the road here, you're going to get paid as the same as a teacher on the same grade in Yorkshire. Um, London, very different. You get paid a load more because everything's so expensive down there. Um, but the same with, the, you know, all the regulated professions are the same. They have a set of terms and conditions uh, that employers are supposed to or encouraged to uh, abide by. Youth work is quite different than that. JNC is the organisation that does that. They negotiate terms and conditions um, between the local government agency and the unions, the youth work unions. Um, and so on our website, if you look up NYA JNC, you'll see something called the Pink Book. Um, and that's the suggested terms and conditions for youth workers across the country. 
Um, so it talks about the hours that youth workers work, the pay they should get with different responsibilities, the qualifications they should have, all of that sort of stuff. Um, now, the reason that standard qualifications are important for that is because if you're going to say, OK, if you qualify at this level and you, then you get this, these terms and conditions and this pay, then the qualifications all have to be of a, of a certain standard. There's no point in having one down in Cornwall that's, that you can do in three months and another one up in Newcastle that takes four years. So we're responsible for standardising those qualifications and making sure they're all of an equal sort of quality. Uh, and the way it works is everyone refers to kind of JNC qualifications. It's actually us that does the endorsement of them. So through this committee called ETS, we're the ones who say, yes, this qualification is of a standard. Um, and the way it works is JNC then recognise that. So the way to think about it is they're in charge of kind of terms and conditions. We help them out by saying, well, OK, if someone's qualified to this level, then you can be rest assured that it's the same as someone qualified at a different university to the same level. Um, but they're called JNC Youth Workers uh, because of custom and tradition, really. Um, so the qualifications that we oversee range from level two, uh, which is kind of entry level uh, youth worker, JNC call it youth support worker, up to level seven, um, which is master's level. And I'll go through in a bit, I'll go through all the different levels and different different routes in, in between all of that. The important thing, and again, it might be useful for you to have a look at, just because it's a handy document if you're in youth work, uh, is that all of those qualifications are linked to something called the National Occupational Standards. So again, if you've got pens, or I can send a link to Chris later, um, go on our website and Google NYA New NOS, N-O-S, uh, you'll get a link to the National Occupational Standards. That's a fat document. It's about 40-odd pages. Um, well, it's about 40-odd standards with about three pages each. And it talks about all the things that youth workers should be able to do. Um, so that's in terms of developing relationship with young people. It's in terms of health and safety, safeguarding, managing buildings. All of that sort of stuff is in the National Occupational Standards in quite a lot of detail. Um, and all the qualifications, level two through to level seven, are mapped against those standards. So if you study um, any of those qualifications, um, you will be gaining competencies that are directly related to those national occupational standards. And they're not just in England, they're shared across uh, the four nations. So um, I attend a meeting with my counterparts in Ireland, Wales, Scotland, um, uh, where we standardise the qualifications. We check that the national occupational standards are still relevant, um, current, you know, and they do get updated every sort of five or six years. Um, and that also means that if you qualify in England, those qualifications are recognised um, elsewhere in the four nations. So if you're a qualified youth worker in England, then you can get a job in Ireland, both the Republic and Northern Ireland, um, that's asking for a youth work qualification. We're also, because of the Albemarle Report and because of our history, we're sort of leaders in the world with, well, it's frustrating, and I'll explain why in a bit. Um, but in terms of this infrastructure for qualification and the number of courses that we have and that we've had, um, we're doing better than most of the rest of the world in terms of youth work qualification. People look to us. So I do quite a lot of work with the Commonwealth who are trying to develop the same sorts of systems and are using our national occupational standards. Uh, so in addition to that, the other stuff we do is... Um, we, we're champions of youth work. We, we, we want to promote it. We want youth work everywhere. So we've got a vision for youth work, um, which talks about wanting to recruit another 10,000 professionally qualified or train another 10,000 professionally qualified youth workers in the next seven years. Professional qualification is kind of degree level and above. Um, we do a load of research and reports to help inform the sector. They're all available on our website free. You can get involved in those. Um, and the other, I mean, you know, the workforce strategy is a piece of work that I've had to do which is aimed at sort of getting youth work, getting towards that 10,000 extra qualified staff and making youth work kind of a key part of local strategy. That's where I want to get to with that. I think youth work's got a really important role to play um, in localities, um, in and amongst other sectors, you know, health and education and criminal justice. I think youth work brings something unique um, and different. And um, so a big part of my job is trying to make sure that that gets recognised by decision makers and funders and they understand the role that youth work plays. And the qualification and training is part of all of that. 
So that's the MYA. That's kind of where we fit in the landscape of qualification and a bit of history about it. This is the more interesting stuff. So these are the various qualifications. Well, these are some of the various qualifications that you can do. Um, and I will be quite quick talking you through them. We're doing for time. Yes, I'm on, I'm on target. So numbers start at one and go up. Level one isn't a JNC endorsed qualification. So you can't, if people are asking for a JNC qualification, you only got a level one. Um, it doesn't count. However, it is available. Um, so there are some training organisations that deliver it. And it's an introduction to youth work. It says, this is what youth work is. This is how youth work works. These are the main sort of uh, structures and strategies that are involved in youth work. Um, so it gives people an idea of it. It's aimed kind of um, as an entry thing for maybe young people uh, who were in the youth club who were interested in youth work. Or sometimes some volunteers and voluntary agencies use it for their volunteers. Um, the reason it's not a JNC endorsed qualification, or the JNC don't recognise it as a qualification for youth workers, um, is that one of the criteria for qualifying as a youth worker and being um, recognised by the JNC is practice. So you can do the level one without actually being a youth worker and without actually working with young people. All of the rest of the endorsed qualifications, you have to have some practice time, you have to work with young people. And the amount of time you have to have goes up until you get to degree level. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, I mean, there's lots and lots of theories to learn, but you don't know if you're a decent youth worker unless you can actually be in a room with a bunch of young people and get along with them and, and do your job. Uh, so level one's kind of an introduction. Level two and level three. So level two award is the foundation units for the certificate and diploma. There, there's a load of modules for each of these. And the level two award is the very, very basic ones that you have to do, theory of youth work that sort of stuff. Level three diploma in the level three uh, certificate, that's where you become recognized by JNC as a youth support worker. And so the kind of level of responsibility that they explain for that level of qualification is you work in a youth center, you're not the youth worker in charge, but you're doing youth work, yeah? Um, and again, as I say, you can be a youth worker without any of these. It's um, This is just sort of a legacy of, and something we'd encourage to, um, get the standards of youth work and the recognition of youth work alongside teaching and social work and all that. Um, so yeah, level two award, level two certificate, level three certificate, they're all kind of the youth support worker level and they go up level two certificate, level two, level, sorry, level two award, level two certificate, level three certificate, level three diploma. Um, then there's a jump in the JNC qualifications to level six. So level six is a degree, takes three years usually. Um, you've got to do 800 hours of practice with young people um, and it covers the uh, national occupational standards in, in a lot of detail. Looking at qualifications, the difference between all these different levels is really something called command verbs. So in my world, you have to get really stuck into this and it's terribly boring. But the, diff <laughs> the difference in command verbs are things like Rather than uh, a question, an essay question that says, I don't know, list the skills a youth worker has, that would be a kind of level two, level three question. Level six, level seven, it wouldn't say list, it would say critically analyse the differences between the skills that a youth worker has and which are most use. So as you go up the levels, you look at practice in a more detailed and more forensic, kind of a more critical way. And that's the only difference between them all, really um the level of detail that you do so those are the official jnc qualifications this is a kind of map of where jnc put them in terms of uh what you can do i'll talk about the apprenticeships in a sec so skilled worker level two so you've got some skills you know the bit of theory of youth work whatever else not to say that you can't get that without doing these qualifications qualifications you can this just recognizes that skill level um so skilled worker, assistant youth worker level two, youth support worker level three. That's the one that I was telling you about there. And then professional youth worker level is up here. So university qualifications, degrees and uh, masters. I'm going to talk a little bit about the apprenticeships because they're new. Um, so all of these training courses so far you had to pay to go on to. There's, there is a bursary scheme um, where we get a bit of funding from government so that people can qualify at level two and level three. But those places are really limited. Um, and the problem we were having, and last year is a real indication, um, 
if you're thinking of a career and getting a professional qualification working with young people and you're looking at youth work social work and teaching social work and teaching have got a real clear career path They've, they're statutory professions and so you have to get paid a certain amount to work in them youth work isn't like that youth work as you know works across a load of different agencies some pay to jnc scales some don't um, it's not as regulated and so since um, course fees were introduced for degrees, the number of students has fallen through the floor. It's gone from probably about 900 enrolments or 1,000 enrolments every year down to last year we had 250. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, people don't want to end up £27,000 in debt with no guarantee of a job that's going to be able to pay off at the end of it, I think. Um, and so to deal with that, we introduced the apprenticeships and their ace. Because um, what they mean is that you can uh, learn and get the same qualifications so you can get a level three or you can get a BA honours degree um, doing one day a week in college and the rest of your time in your job and you can get paid your own salary for doing it. Um, and so last year, it's interesting, we're coming to a, a point of crisis really in BA honours qualifications. Last year we had eight degree courses closed down in the country, leaving us only with about 16. We also, though, opened another seven degree apprenticeship qualifications. And those seven between them are training in the very first year more than double the amount of students that those eight degree courses that have closed um, were going to put through. So my hope is that we still have some degree courses that are just degree courses because I think there's some value in it. But I think the way that training is going over the next few years if you want to become professionally qualified, the apprenticeship route um, is probably most likely the way you're going to be doing it. And in some ways, that's really good because it means that you're, you're learning with experience and you can sort of really, you know, get stuck into that reflective practice and, and everything you're learning on your days in college can be applied in the, in the, in the workplace and stuff. So those are all new. If you want um, to find out any information about those, give us a shout. They're employer-led. If you're interested in doing an apprenticeship, and you're employed as a youth worker, speak to your employer. Some of the barriers are that you need to be employed for 30 hours a week. Um, and we know that not every agency can afford to pay that. We are looking at ways in which we can um, be creative about uh, supporting people who aren't employed for 30 hours a week. Um, but other than that, it's a fairly straightforward process for getting involved in. So that's all the accredited stuff. That's all the stuff that qualifies you as a youth worker recognized by JNC and us. Aside from that, there's a bunch of other stuff. There's a level four certificate in professional development um, in youth work, which is a whole bunch of individual units that look at specialisms. So street work, work around race and racism, management and leadership, all of that. Um, we launched those last year. There's a few training organizations picking those up. We've got a bursary to deliver some of them as well. And the idea behind that is that throughout your career, you can just keep topping up with some other skills and specialisms that aren't necessarily covered in your day-to-day -day work and aren't necessarily covered in the professional raft of qualifications. Again, give me a shout if you want any more information about those. We also have a whole bunch of free stuff on our website. One of the things that we're trying to do is encourage youth workers to view their career as a learning experience and to keep updating their skills. And so aside from the stuff you've got to pay for, if you go on our website, there's masses and masses and masses of free training um, that you can uh, just log on to, do yourself. Some of it's accredited, some of it isn't. Ow, that was the cat again. And um, yeah, it's, 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 the idea is that, that sort of throughout your career, you stay interested and you stay engaged and you stay learning new stuff. And there is always stuff to learn in youth work. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about it. Um, and all of this is linked to standards. So the other thing that we do at NYA is, is talk about quality standards in youth service provision. And we do state that, you know, some youth services should have some qualified staff. They should have, um, they should be delivering to certain standards. And those are all outlined in the Raising the Bar Youth Work Practice Standards document that, again, is on our website. That's it for me. I mean, I've got loads more to say, but I won't um, unless people ask me questions because I'm up to time. Uh, now I've got to work out how to not share how do i not share chris uh, let's have a quick look let's see, if we can, <laughs> see if we can unshare you yeah unshare me uh you should just be able to go to the share screen bottom oh yeah no, i've got it i've got it, okay. I've got it. yeah stop that should, share there that we go. Should do. 
Great right, thank you, everyone. Sorry, I didn't realise I was banging on a bit there. No, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Kevin. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions at this point? Or if you've got any questions you'd like to put, in, like the to put in the chat? Hi. Yes, I have a question. It's Catherine Shrimp from Ambrook. Hi. 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 Yes, so I just want to double check if there is any kind of convalidation for this accreditation. So, for example, people that has degree or master's degree in other areas, there is any kind of way that they can convalidate some courses or some modules that they already taken and just go for the specific to get a higher qualification? So that's a very, so that's a very, oh, there's a bit of an echo. That's a very, very good question. Um, at the moment, so the, the mechanism we use to quality control degree qualifications is our sort of validation requirements. So what that is, is a big old document that's got a load of stuff in it that universities have to meet for us to say, yes, okay, you can do that. And it covers resourcing of the course and curriculum and everything. In that, um, it says you can have people joining a course with prior learning experience, but that prior learning experience has to be gained at a university or a course that's already JNC qualified. So what it means is that if you were doing a youth work course in Plymouth and you left after the first year, you could then join the one in Sunderland in year two. Um, but if you were doing, because Plymouth and Sunderland are both JNC accredited, um, but if you were doing youth studies, for example, in Gloucester, which isn't a JNC course because it doesn't have the practice stuff, um, you couldn't use that as prior learning. Um, that's a problem. And it's a problem that um, I'm trying to look at because one of the things is that you may or may not know, we're really, really short of professionally qualified staff. Um, and a lot of people who are working in social work and teaching wouldn't mind being youth workers, but they don't want to do another degree. Um, so we are looking at ways in which we can uh, map the national occupational standards to those qualifications. So youth studies, teaching, social work, um, so that people can jump into courses at a later date. Um, it's not just me that decides that. There's a committee that oversees all of this that's made up from practitioners. So there'd be an argument about it, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is something that we want to be able to do. At the moment, you can't. The level four is another one. The level four's got loads and loads and loads of really useful stuff. And ideally, sooner or later, I want to make that so that, you know, you can do a unit, two units, three units every year and do that for three or four years. And then all of a sudden, you're halfway through a degree, you know, and you've only got 18 months to do rather than three years. I'd love that. Um, so that's all a work in progress. But at the moment, no, you can only go in halfway through a course if you've done the first half through a, an existing JNC course. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. I'm just going to ask one more question at this point and then we'll we'll move on and then we'll come back to, to Q&A if that's okay. And uh, Nicola, I'm just going to combine a couple of your questions about uh, accredited trainers. Um, what qualifications should a trainer have to be able to deliver, for example, levels, levels two and three? Um, and when then where can you find, you know, trainers with those those levels of qualifications and who are accredited? Good, good questions. Um, so the level for level two and three, the um, the way that you uh, the training centre delivers those is they register with one of the awarding organisations that we work with that hold the qualification, and their qualification guide says what's necessary. Um, but in summary, all of them are the same. Um, for some of the units at level two and three, so for the theory of youth work units, you have to have someone who's professionally qualified to JNC six and above, um, but only for those units. Um, and they also have to have a bit of experience. They've got two or three years experience. Um, but as I say, only for those units. For the other units, you don't need a JNC qualification. You need relevant experience. And I suppose if you're a training center, or if you're thinking of setting up as a training center, the other thing you will need is assessors qualifications um, and quality assurance qualifications. They're really short. You can do them in two or three days. Um, but the reason for that is that because the awarding organisations there are responsible for making sure that everyone who goes through those um, qualifications is of a certain standard, they have to make sure that the people doing the assessment of the people who are learning know what they're doing. And so that's why they ask for those. Um, but yeah, so for some of the units, you need a JNC. For many, you don't. You just need a bit of experience. If you need any more information, detailed information about that, give me a shout. I can send you a qualification guide for each of the uh, awarding organisations that run it. That's great. 
Thank you, Kevin. Um, so if you've, if you've got any questions about uh, qualifications or anything that Kevin's been talking about, please feel free, you know, if, if it occurs to you in a second, in a minute or two, feel free, feel, please feel free to pop them in the chat and let us know and we'll collate them and we'll come back uh, at the end when we have a Q&A and I'll, I'll, I'll pitch a few in, in your direction if that's all right. Um, what I wanted to do now is I just wanted to introduce Mariam and Yara. Uh, Mariam and Yara are both uh, qualified youth workers who are working within the Northwest London area and they are really helpfully going to share a little bit of their experience, a little bit of their youth work journey, but also to give you a sense of um, how being qualified and how their learning has impacted their career, how it's helped their development and um, you know, why it's, what they see the benefits being and why it's so important. Um, so I'm going to pick, I'm going to flip a coin. I'm going to ask Mariam if you're happy to, to go first um, and just to give us a, a, a sort of a, a four or five minutes on your experience of being qualified. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I'm Mariam, I'm the Youth Finance Programme Manager at Young Westminster Foundation, and I am a qualified youth worker. Um, so I've been a youth worker for a very long time. I was quite lucky. Um, I got into youth work because I just used to attend a youth club. And what my youth workers realised was I was really good at holding sessions for other young people. And it was, I was 16 when I got my level, when I started my level three youth work course. And for me, at that time, I wasn't really even sure if I wanted to go back, if I want what I wanted to do, if I wanted to go uni, if um, the college, the courses I was doing at college were for me. So what that did was it really instilled in me that youth work was the way forward. And I wanted to actually start specialising in something alongside being a youth worker, but also having a specialism where I work with young people in a different capacity. So after I did my level three, I actually went to uni a few years later and I actually got my degree in youth work. So I went goldsmith, which is amazing. Um, there's a few challenges along the way, as it is, it is youth work. So we're quite well equipped to deal with them. And um, I just felt like it was an amazing journey for me in getting qualified, because what that then meant was for other young people, and also the young people I was working with, they actually saw that if someone said, oh, do you want to just do it? We used to run level two youth work for young people. It was also an avenue for them to actually see, oh, one of your youth works actually started off as a young person as well. Um, so for me, when I went to uni, I started looking into getting into a, the different specialisms. And for me, I had a personal connection to youth violence. And having grown up in some of the areas and some of the situations I'd experienced, it became something that I felt quite comfortable with actually starting to explore. So um, alongside being a youth worker, where one thing I've realized is once you're a youth worker, you can never really let go. Um, I've been a youth worker, I've been a gangs worker, I've done youth work in a, in a lot of settings from local authority, working in charities. I work for both lo smaller regional charities to lo um, national charities doing youth work, but I've also worked in prisons and in hospitals um, working victims of violence. So for me, it was, I've done the delivery now. Now, how can I start using some of the knowledge and the skill sets that I've learned as a youth worker and informing wider practice, which is where the transition came to me becoming a program manager. And now with my role currently, I look after um, programs, just a single program that then goes on to fund other programs, looking at addressing the impact of serious youth violence on a community level. And what my experiences has really um, helped me um, in developing this program and actually creating it was, are they able to make it really accessible for grassroots organisations and young people. It is a complete community and youth-led organised um, programme that we have now where um, our steering group is made up of local practitioners who are close to the issue, who experience, but also are being held accountable the same way we'd hold a higher level steering group accountable. We wanted to make sure that the young people and the community members that we work with directly had an understanding who have an understanding, sorry, of some of the issues that we're seeing, we're able to inform on it. And one thing that I am very sure of is if I wasn't a youth worker and I didn't have the experiences that I did and also the knowledge set around the, some of the theories that you are taught whilst you are getting qualified, I wouldn't have been able to put it into practice in the way that we have that it's accessible, but also adapt, adaptable to whatever we need to adapt it to. Um, we The programme itself that I run now, we've been able to develop it and run it in a different locality with a very different set of needs and outcomes that we're achieving. 
leave but as a youth worker because we're quite used to sort of when it comes to even through funding and somewhat like how quickly a program can change depending on what the funder might require but also what the young people and the cohort of young people you're working with that that level of understanding but also the qualification of understanding how theory works and how to also put it into practice but as a manager helped me to sort of create a program that is then accessible and adaptable to whoever it is and the idea is is that with the program that we've now created we can start handing it off to a community organization to now run the delivery of it but also at the same time as for me as the person who is strategic lead for it is helping them and developing their skill set to be able to manage that and one thing that I truly believe is with youth work, what you're taught with youth work, you can't actually learn it anywhere else because like Kevin was saying, it's the practice-based stuff. So every single youth worker is very different. You can't duplicate a person, therefore you can't duplicate their practice. But one thing you can duplicate is the shared understanding and the learning behind it all. And one of the things that I am very, very, I'm a very big advocate of is having like a baseline and a framework and a shared understanding with everyone who's working along in the same sector. So us at Young Westminster, we're quite lucky where we look after our workforce development programs and we can inform on a lot of it. So for me, it's about how can we make that accessible to a wider range rather than just those who are qualified? Because we've got youth workers who might not have the skill set to be able to get qualified or the time or the capacity. But for us, it's like, okay, how can we ensure that we create a system and we create the opportunity for you to be able to do that? And I feel like I'm over Chris, so I will stop now. No, that's great. Thank you, Mariam. Um, it's really exciting to hear sort of your, you know, your journey from being, you know, getting qualified at the age that you did to, you know, that direct line that you draw between your qualifications and your practice of your understanding of, of, of youth work and, and your, you know, your, your kind of professional vocation to where you are now designing you know whole systems and, and programs of youth work from a really strategic level and i think it's made it really clear that kind of that straight line through the middle there from being qualified and and you know having having that that skill and that that understanding so thank you i could have listened to you talk about that for a lot longer um so i really really appreciate it um yara would you like to sort of introduce yourself and and just give us a little bit of an idea about your background Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yara. I'm the CEO and senior youth worker at Jamal Edwards Delve, which is a, a grassroots youth work organisation charity based in Ealing. Um, so we run open access youth work, essentially, in open access youth centres. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm going to be um, touching upon quite a few things that Kevin and Marion both covered, um, because I completely agree on some of those points. So, my kind of journey into youth work was um, I'd worked in kind of about spent about a decade working with young people in kind of informal settings um, and then realized that that was sort of the thing that I wanted to do. Um, and so I went and pursued a master's in youth work um, 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 as a fellow classmate of Mariam, although I'm sure there's a massive age gap between us, but I also went to Goldsmiths um, and yeah, and I think um, part of so it's, it's, I've got a couple of points. So in terms of, I guess, as a practitioner, I think doing kind of studying, getting qualified in youth work, really, again, reiterating what Mariam touched upon and Kevin, is the idea of really applying, putting theory into practice and understanding how to really do that. Um, so across the board, if I'm not mistaken, there are national occupational standards. Um, and whilst they were not always the most enjoyable process of going through them and meeting them and, and really evidencing how the work that you're doing meets those national occupational standards, sort of eight years on now, um, I kind of realised that actually they've been really helpful in different aspects of my day to day job now. So when we look at fundraising, when we look at talking about the impact of our work, when we look at really being able to articulate what kind of youth work approach or what kind of youth work practice um, we're, we're kind of working with, um, having that sort of um, that experience as part of the degree really helped me to understand how to evidence our work, which is really important when we look at fundraising, for example. So how do we talk about our work and how do we make it in a way where it is impactful and it shows? Because I think often one thing we suffer from as youth workers is really showing the impact of our work. Um, so that in terms of um, kind of how 
a qualification can help you with that. That's definitely a massive thing for me um, and being able to demonstrate our work. I think the other thing is um, doing a qualification in youth work really helps develop reflective practice. So whether that's through supervisions, whether that's through discussions with um, peers, um, and reflective practice is a massive part of youth work because without that, we we lose the intention, the intentions that we put behind youth work because we're not play workers, we're youth workers. And actually there is intention and there is theory and there are values that underpin the work that we do. Um, and kind of going down that formal route of studying youth work can really help with that. And then I guess also as an employer, one of the, so at the moment we're trying, well, we're looking for a full-time youth worker. And one of the things that we are really focusing on is whether that person has, of course, both the experience of working with young people, because we can't take away from the value of that either, but also whether they have a qualification in youth work, because that gives us that confidence and that kind of push to be able to say actually this person can and will be able to meet the skills that we need for the role. Um, I also found during the interview process that those who were, who were qualified were much better at articulating their practice and their approach and what that really looked like with young people. Um, now I'm absolutely not taking away from the different routes that one comes into youth work and actually having that practical experience is embedded in all of the qualifications. So, and then on a kind of practical level, the placements or the the kind of one-to-one -one, um, work with young people, um, the placements are not just about kind of putting theory into practice, but also it's exposing yourself to different youth work settings and the opportunities that can come off of that. So the placements that I did during my master's in youth work led me directly to the role that I'm currently in today. Um, and that was because of that exposure to that space, to different practitioners in the sector, to the locality, to young people. So there's a lot of value, not just in, OK, how do you apply this kind of theoretical model into your day to day, but also what does that exposure mean for you as a professional and a practitioner? And then finally, I think what Kevin said was particularly important. And I, and I think we see it a lot on the ground where social workers, teachers, you know, it's a much more standardized profession. And often that means that they are taken slightly more seriously than youth workers. Um, and actually having that professionalization of our profession is, is really important when we are in different multidisciplinary spaces where we are working with other professionals, because we're saying that this is, this is a profession, there is a route into this, um, and there is incredible value in what youth workers bring to their communities. Um, and I think that was really it for me. I hope I haven't taken too much time, but yeah, thank you. Not at all. Thank you ever so much, Yara. Again, it's just really interesting to hear sort of a couple of different perspectives and in particular, you know, your perspective on kind of having been through that qualification journey yourself and now looking, you know, to employ others to bring on members of staff and how, you know, when you're looking for understanding if somebody works the way that you do or to kind of to, you know, get a sense of, of their practice that actually qualification and the standards framework is, you know, something that you're using and that can can, can give people a leg up um, in, in an employment picture as well. So that's uh, really interesting. Thank you to you both. Could listen to could listen to you both for much, much longer. Might have to get back to talk at length at another point. Um, what we had some time for now is basically just some time for, for questions, really, um, either for Kevin or for Mariam or for Yara. Um, you're very welcome to uh, to raise a hand and ask those or to pop those in the chat um, and we will we'll pick them up as we go. I know that Kevin's kindly been picking up a few questions along the way in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, if you if anyone would like to raise their hand, then, then go for it. You're very welcome to ask, ask any questions. Yep. Yeah, Keisha, I can see a, a hand up in the corner there. Yeah. Hi, this is um to the youth workers. If you could give us a kind of typical, and maybe there's not a typical day, but just for people thinking of um doing a youth work qualification, the level of work it's going to take realistically is give us an idea of what it actually takes on a day-to-day -day basis. You get up, you go to work, and this is what you're likely to have to decide I'm ready to commit to. Does anyone in particular fancy taking that one? 
or I can I can ask one of you to to go for it. Mariam, you're smiling. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw I'll that one. You smiled. You twitched. Much. Yeah, you twitched <laughs> first. So I'm afraid you've got that one. Um, it's been a while since I've been a full time youth worker, but a day to day would be um for if, if you are just a youth worker and you're not looking after a, so in a management a, a management position, it would be you're attending the session and going through a debrief a, a, a debrief first with your team, looking at what the plan is for the day, but also having to look at if there's um, additional facilitators in the building, if there's additional setup that needs to be taking place, and um, and then sort of just making sure that's set up for young people. In a session, you, I've never had a session, a youth work session, that's always two sessions that have been the same, in all honesty. Um, you have to be able to be quite reactive to what's happening, but a lot of the time, good planning um, which I think with youth work and the skills that with the qualifications that comes with it is being able to plan for all occurrences, but also having the right number of staff in the building. And it would mean also having a debrief and ensuring that the next time round you've got that in place where, OK, this has happened. How can we build this and make sure that this isn't some if something has gone wrong, it's seen as a development point rather than something that's gone wrong. And that challenge can be overcome quite easily. Uh, Yara, you might want to jump in here, I feel like. Um, yeah. Also, this is in relation to you doing the qualification alongside uh, going to work. So what does it look like having to go to work, do all of what you just said, plus you're supposed to be studying something. What does that look like, I suppose, in a day-to-day? -day? Yeah. So, Keisha, I guess for me, it's, it was slightly different because I did the degree full time. And so that's obviously that would be your day to day. So you'd be doing three days a week and then probably two days a week of placement work. So actual youth work in practice. Um, I have supported one of my team members to go through a level two. So that what that looks like would be your standard delivery, but you would need to make so rather than having that monthly supervision, I was having a longer monthly supervision with lots more check ins around the work that they were doing, supporting them with any kind of pieces of so some so some of the, for example, some of the outcomes might be um you know uh, deliver some group work with the group of young people so how do you support that staff member to be able to kind of have those spaces with it, where they are able to do that work I don't know if that helps kind of answer your question yeah so I guess they're given a sort of set of criteria for that week or that day and then you're sort of going in and saying how, how have you done it but also what support do you need yeah. to do in because order I think to it has you know, Level. part of it is it, it comes from the from the person themselves, right? And it's actually a it's it's an independent thing that they're doing. But obviously, we do need to support them in terms of, and obviously, having more experience in youth work, it's guiding them through some difficult situations, interactions with young people, how to meet a particular outcome. So it could look like different things, but yeah, absolutely, it's sort of the slight hand holding and providing the support, and then the learning kind of element where they get stuck on challenging stuff. Okay, thank you. Kevin, did you have anything in terms of kind of a uh, an overview, maybe of the um, the kind of the amount of hours expected and commitment around those, especially in particular the twos and threes, because that may also fill out part of that question. Uh, I know it depends on the on the awarding. Yeah, I mean the um, so the twos and threes are aimed at people who are in work, and so the idea is that you can do them in your own time. Uh, the level three, as far as I'm aware, and it depends on the training provider, takes about 18 months to complete. Um, but it's assumed that you've got a full time job while you're doing it. Um, so there'll be some evenings where you've got to do some assessment work. A lot of the assessment is often portfolio. So you're not writing 2000 word essays. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's those qualifications are designed for people who are in the job and are working and are designed not to be too onerous. Um, the degree qualification. A good rule of thumb is that the credit value of a qualification, one credit takes 10 hours. Um, so the degrees are 360 credits. So that's 3,600 hours, which is 150 days. Um, so given that that's over three years, um, 50 full days of study time, um, including your work placements, uh, isn't hugely onerous, you know. Most of the degrees that um, are operating at the moment tend to have kind of two days in college, and the apprenticeship is is aimed at uh, if you're doing a, a, an apprenticeship, whether it's the level three or the level six, uh, you'll be working for contracted for at least thirty hours in a week, 
and six of those will be off the job learning. So off the job learning is partly face to face stuff with your tutors, seminars, also your own study and essays and that sort of stuff. So the apprenticeships kind of, you know, four days a week in the in, in work and, and a day a week um, doing your studies. Work though is, you know, you've got to apply yourself. It's um it's it's harder than just doing the job. Um, but it would be, you know. <laughs> and why do people give up? If anyone decides they've started on this journey, what is the main thing that makes somebody give up and not finish? Because that would help me to know how, you know. Yes, that's a really good question, Keisha. Yeah. And, we have an, um, and and the huge variety of reasons. You know, it's uh, it's difficult to pin them down. I think the 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 most common one, that, and it, this is just anecdotal. We haven't got proper data on all of this, um, but the most common one is about the additional pressure. You know, um, so you're in a job, you're earning money, um, you've got to work towards your qualification as well. Um, you might have a family, you might have. The, you know you might have long covid you might have whatever else you know and and so when those pressures add up the first thing usually that can give is your studies um so that's i mean you know anecdotally that's what i hear from people um the other one i suppose would be finance um if you're paying to do a degree qualification uh nine thousand pounds a year is quite a lot of money and if your financial situation changes and you can no longer afford to do that, then that will be a very sort of solid reason to um, to not complete your studies. Um, and that's the main reason why we we um, put the apprenticeship in place, you know, because it's it's all of a sudden you can get a degree without ending to ending up £27,000 in debt. You know, it's all the training costs are covered and you can still earn money while you're doing it. But yeah, I mean, it's... Pressure, I would say, is is the is the the reason that I hear most commonly. People get other stuff going on in their lives, and to accommodate that stuff, the one thing that they they can give up is the, is the studies, you know. But that's the same with with any study, I imagine. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, location. Thanks, thanks, Kevin, for that for that answer. Um, got a couple of hands up. I'm going to see how many I can get to. Get to as many as possible. Um, if We've only got a couple of minutes left, sort of seven minutes left. So if you do, if you've got your hand up, if you also, I'm just going to throw to Nicola now, um, as I know you've had your hand up a little while, but everybody else, if you'd just like to jot your question down in the chat, I'll do my best to get around to them. But if I don't, we will follow up with those specifically afterwards to make sure that, that we get you some answers for them. Um, and just to ask as we work through, if we could try and keep ourselves to kind of one sort of one question. And if we've got follow up again, we can, we'll pop that in the chat and go from there if that's okay. Okay, so, so Nicola. Um, I was going to ask Kevin a question about the bursaries and how we can access some of that bursary funding. I want to briefly comment on the questions we've just had, though, because I have done the level five in playwork. It did take about 18 months. We used to, I used to deliver all of the equivalent qualifications for playwork. They take 18 to 24 months. That re that's realistic. There's a lot of work. You know, I was working on my portfolio not every weekend, but a lot of weekends. And, and that is why people drop out. What I would suggest that we do to try to make this work is what we used to do is we used to start off lots of people on the award. You know, So if you're doing the level two award or the level three award, start loads of people on the award and then only take the, only the ones that are, do really well with the award and are really enthusiastic and committed to it, go on to the certificate and, and so on until you get through to the diploma. And because there, there will be dropout, you've got much lower dropout with the award qualification though. And that at least gives people some knowledge, a taster. It's really good for the people who've already got a degree in something else and just want to learn a bit and get a bit of a taster about youth work. So. That, that would be, be my advice. And also, you know, we're new to this, we're new to doing qualifications. So let's make it easy for ourselves. Let's start with the award because it's the most straightforward one to deliver. Um, that's that's my suggestions. Thank you, Nicola. Um, and I'll follow up. I know you had a question about the bursaries. We'll follow up with that and put that in the, in the, uh, the follow-up document. Um, Luke, you had your hand up. Um, hiya. Um, I was just wondering, um, I just popped my question in the chat, but I was just asking if uh, we were to do the level two to start off for our 
charity I saw on one of the pages it was an assistant role so would we need a level three or higher qualified person in the building to do the assistant uh, to have the level two assistant role that makes sense <laughs> um it, it's a very good question there's no statutory requirement to have anyone qualified in any youth work building at all um so and that's one of the uh, one of the joys and one of the difficulties of youth work. So, you know, you can have a, a youth centre staff full of professionally qualified staff. You can have Janet and Darren's Kids and Karate Club where they just know some young people, you know. Um, good practice would be, well, yeah, so but according to the JNC terms and conditions, um, they suggest that you need a professionally qualified youth worker in charge. Um, supported by assistant youth worker or support you know, youth support workers, um, so. But that's not necessarily sort of uh, coming from the. Well, it's kind of coming informed by what good practice is, but it's more informed about terms and conditions and pay. Um, that's the the angle that JNC come at it from. Um, our standards, uh, so the, the raising the bar, youth work practice standards, all recommend you have a professionally qualified member of staff at least one um, in on sessions all, all the time, supported by volunteers and, and uh, level two and level three qualified staff. But there's no legal requirement at all. It's not a statutory profession, you know. Um, anybody can be a youth worker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, what I, I think we've had some more questions in the chat. I can't see any more hands up. So just to make sure, because I know it's half term and people have will have places to be. Many of you will probably be popping off to, to some form of delivery this afternoon as well. I thought we'll just close up there if that's okay. Thank you everyone for your questions. Really, really interesting. And again, any more that you have, if they occur to you while you're in the shower later or whilst you're cooking dinner, then please pop them through over email and we will collate those all and get some get some responses back to you as well. I just wanted to say a really big thank you to, to Kevin, to Yara and to Mariam for sharing your, your expertise and your insight today. It's been really lovely to have you with us. Um, and you know, would, would love to hear you talk about your work at much greater length at another point because um, it's absolutely fascinating so a big thank you again thank you for spending your time with us and thank you to everybody for joining uh, we will follow up in the next couple of days with some more q a um, but in the meantime thank you ever so much and enjoy the rest of your day take care thanks so much